Now, as anyone who's dipped a toe into the music analytical literature will know, Benjamin Britten's compositions have been liberally sprinkled with such jargon-laden attentions. Indeed, he's become the subject of a formidable analytical industry, quite the equal of that devoted to any other composer of the 20th century. Much of this specialist work has been informative. It has, if nothing else, served as a corrective to those who've sought in a common strain of Britain commentary, alas, occasionally still with us, have sought to devalue his work as superficial or reactionary. However, the Gresham project won't tolerate that kind of specialist discourse. As always, the greatest challenge for its professors is to communicate to a non-specialist audience. Gresham lecturers nearly always need to keep near at hand a dictum that the great literary critic Frank Kermode called, quote, one of the less offensive precepts of Lord Chesterfield, unquote. It goes like this. This is what Lord Chesterfield said, quote, speak the language of the company you are in and speak it purely and unlarded with any other, unquote. So that today is my aim with larding implements safely sheathed and properly sequestered. I begin my exploration. So Britain's first string quartet was mostly written and was completed in a tool shed. The shed in question being situated in Escondido, a small town in Southern California, not far from the Mexican border. This circumstance immediately locates the work in what was a formative, traumatic, and reputationally risky interlude in Britain's famously mono-geographical existence, about as far from his lifelong residences on the chilly shores of East Anglia as can be imagined. The time was 1941. In May 1939, Britain had embarked on a ship taking him to the United States. It wasn't emigration, certainly, but at least it was a trip with an undefined ending. The motivations behind this extended sojourn in America were, of course, complex. A feeling that he was insufficiently appreciated in his home country was certainly one factor. The fact that his friend and sometime collaborator, W.H. Auden, had led the way was possibly another. That his friend and soon-to-be partner, lifelong partner, Peter Pierce, that he wanted to go for professional reasons was certainly a third. But underneath all these practical issues and perhaps a deciding factor was a feeling common enough at the time among creative people and others that Europe, then teetering on the verge of another disastrous war, was in terminal decline. For someone like Britain, who had intense pacifist views, this was a dystopian time to be European. Now, before California, and apart from some concertizing here and there, Britain's main US residences had been strongly contrasting. For a period of many months, he and Piers took up residence in the home of German emigres William and Elizabeth Mayer in Amityville on Long Island. At one point, Britain became quite seriously ill and was faithfully nursed by Elizabeth, who evidently supplied the kind of domesticity that the composer forever seemed to crave. However, in late 1940, he and Piers moved into New York City to take up residence in a bohemian menage ruled over by Auden, with, according to some, Hattie Jakes-like matronly control, and with a constantly changing entourage of bizarre friends and hangers-on. The stripper Gypsy Rose Lee was there for a time. Uh, what passed between Britain and Gypsy Rose Lee is not recorded. Now, this was doubtless liberating for Britain in various ways, but it was emphatically not the routine that he always needed. Hence, his and Piers' cross-country escape, which occurred in the early summer of 1941, when they went over to California. The tool shed in Escondido was, in this sense, a welcome release and a temporary haven. The major problem of the stay was with their hosts, a husband and wife piano duo for whom written 
Britain wrote a number of pieces. The wife apparently fell violently in love with Britain, much to the consternation of all interested parties. The composer's most recent biography, Paul Kilday, tells us that at one point the husband, quote, attempted to resolve the situation by withdrawing his claim to his wife, unquote, a gesture that Kilday calls, quote, a spectacularly misplaced act of gallantry, unquote. Love that book. Do buy it. It's a wonderful biography of Britain. Now, understandably enough, it all got a bit too difficult, and the day after the quartet was premiered in Los Angeles in September 1941, Britain and Piers got on the road again, driving back to the East Coast. Incidentally, for the purpose of driving back, they borrowed the car of their hosts. Driving back to the East Coast, and a few months later, making a perilous ocean voyage back to England. This, in a nutshell, was Britain's US sojourn, which had been at best a mixed bag. The financial rewards had not been as great as imagined. More seriously, the war with Germany, declared a few months after Britain had left home, exposed him to increasingly hostile criticism as someone who had deserted his country in its hour of need, etc. What's more, before he and Piers left the US in March, 1942, Auden, perhaps piqued at Britain's desertion of the bohemian lifestyle, sent the composer a devastatingly direct letter accusing him of nothing less than arrested emotional development. I'll quote you a little bit. If you are really to develop your full stature, you will have, I think, to suffer and make others suffer in ways which are totally strange to you at present." Unquote. Now, Britain and Auden's relationship never recovered from this letter. On the other hand, the US, period, the US period saw the appearance of significant new works, including, as well as the quartet, the Violin Concerto, the Sinfonia de Requiem, Les Illuminations, and the Seven Sonnets of Michelangelo. A new self-assurance and breadth emerged in Britain's composerly voice during this period. So in sum, the trip to America was, at least in retrospect, an interstice in a life that was generally uneventful, as, as undisturbed by external forces as it was consistently productive in creative terms. What's more, it was an interstice that, during its final phase, became increasingly imbued with nostalgia and anxiety about the country left behind. And I think this may have some effect on the quartet. Nostalgia and anxiety about the country left behind. Nostalgia for the East Anglian seascape that would be forever Britain's prefer preferred ambience. Anxiety about the war that thundered on, threatening his livelihood and challenging his pacifist views. And also anxiety about the reception he'd receive when he eventually returned. Even amid this uncertainty, perhaps in part because of it, seeds of future directions were emerging precisely in these last months in America. One of the most significant events of the Californian excursion, for example, was a volume that Britain found in a Los Angeles bookshop, a collection of writings that an article uh, uh, by E.M. Forster had already alerted him to. This contained the poems of Suffolk-born George Crabbe. Among them was a long piece called The Borough, in which appears briefly an angry outcast fisherman called Peter Grimes. Now, how does this first string quartet fit into this shifting ambience? In one sense, it fits rather well, I think. While some earlier compositions in the US, in particular the unfortunate popular experiment with the opera Paul Bunyan, written in collaboration with Auden, some of these were all too evidently American-themed. But the string quartet, written in the trip's final phases, looks, as I said, res resolutely back across the Atlantic. Indeed, as the nostalgic product of a composer far from home, nothing could have been more fitting than a string quartet 
in the alarmingly prolific annals of Britain, the juvenile composer, there are probably more quartets than any other genre, with examples charting the teenage prodigy's various enthusiasms, from Beethoven first and then to Mozart, the latter prized because he had a more unruffled exterior and thus was harder to imitate than wilder Willier Ludwig, then to Ravel and Debussy, under this, this under the tutelage of Frank Bridge and then John Ireland. Finally, in something like a passing fancy, Britain had even in string quartet, uh, in the string quartet genre, essayed the perilous extremes of Schoenberg. The quartettino of 1930 has no key signature and even a note row proudly displayed, albeit one of five rather than 12 notes. In other words, and like many a composer before him, Britain used the string quartet as a kind of sketch pad, a place to explore passing enthusiasms with the looming classical giants always present to curb extravagance. Now, in some senses, the first quartet shows a regression from the experimentation of such works as the Quartetino. After all, as Britain, with a nice show of irony, wrote to its commissioner, the redoubtable patroness of the arts, Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge, he wrote that, would it's in, quote, would you believe it, D major, unquote. Perhaps more surprising still, but then string quartets in the 20th century have always had a way of bringing out the conservative side of their composers. Uh, more surprising still, it's also in the regulation for movements of the most august classical predecessors, and even has traces of sonata form, another impedimenta of the distant musical past. All this is to stress that the quartet is a significant milestone in Britain's compositional career, a site in which he confronted some complex compositional problems and solved at least some of them with characteristic invention. Along the way, entering into musical dialogue with his predecessors in a process driven by what the literary critic Harold Bloom famously called the anxiety of influence. Now, there's certainly no doubt that the first movement presses some classical buttons. Like many a Beethoven piece, for example, it has a slow introduction that self-consciously explores unusual textures, is quasi-improvisatory, and that then periodically interrupts the sonata form progression of the movement proper. Now, uh, the music analytical Britain industry that I mentioned near the start of this talk supplies many dense pages demonstrating that uh, coherence always being the desired outcome, the introduction, this strange introduction, and the main movement are bound together by ferociously complicated motivic means. But for most of us, it may be more profitable to think about this movement as one of daring, perhaps even glaring, disjunction. The slow introduction, extraordinary slow introduction, begins as Britain promised Mrs. Coolidge in D major, indeed with a prolonged celebration of that chord. But it's a D major unlike any other, placed extraordinarily high, uh, with the upper three instruments at the very limits of audibility in their range. It really is an extraordinary beginning for a quartet. And with the cello's guitar-like pizzicato isolated far beneath these three instruments. This strange texture, imagine a late, a late Beethoven slow movement on helium and you'll be halfway there. This strange texture gives way to an allegro vivace, an allegro vivo of driving open strings and then a melody that often inhabits the same stratospheric range as the slow introduction and is subject to fairly rigorous contrapuntal treatment. The extreme alternation between this serene, slow introduction and the driving allegro, this informs and structures the entire movement. In fact, in, in spite of the fact that Beethoven is an obvious formal model, the overall impression might well be one of bafflement. Why such extreme contrast? Almost as if two completely different movements have been forced together. Now, if this is indeed the effect, then the second movement, a chugging allegretto con slancio, 
none too distant from the mood of the first movements Allegro is unlikely to clarify very much. <clears throat> For one thing, it is in comparison with the first movement, remarkably short, barely lasting three minutes, while the first movement was three times that length. And one of the extraordinary things about this quartet is the imbalance of length between the movements. You need to be prepared for that. This is uh, this and the gestural similarity with the first movement makes it function something like a coda for the movement that preceded it, although a highly developed one with some startlingly original quartet textures that alternate ferociously demanding unison passages. I should say a whole dissertation could be written about unison in, the tw in 20th century music, but don't worry, I won't go there today. But ferociously demanding unison passages are alternating with sections in which angry stabs of melody seem violently to disturb the potential joviality of the repetitive rhythms. Now, with that brief mo uh, movement over, the second movement over, you're halfway through the quartet and on the brink of mo what most would agree is the work's greatest glory, <clears throat> a slow movement of quite outstanding beauty and impressive length. Now, how to encompass this slow movement in words? In a perceptive review of the work's premiere, the Los Angeles Times critic dubbed this movement, quote, in memoriam, for a lost world. And perhaps that's as apt a description as any. It's set in the unusual time signature of 5-4, which might create a constant sense of rhythmic instability, but actually gives the impression of amplitude and freedom, an improvisatory atmosphere. 5-4 is, is permanently teetering between two sort of modes of organization. You're either going to divide the five, one, two, three, one, two, or one, two, one, two, three. Those inner divisions of the bar are constantly ones which alternate uh, in this movement. Mostly the movements are what you might call a game of couples. At the beginning, for example, two instruments, the two violins, sustain an unchanging drone, while the other two, viola and cello, explore together an impassioned, mostly stepwise melodic arc. Yet again, I think you'll uh, find the inevitable point of reference here is late Beethoven, a connection made even more forcibly when, in the latter stages of the movement, each instrument in turn explores angular, declamatory gestures, almost a wordless recitative, an attempt to cross the barrier between music and words. In the textural simplicity and piquant harmonic clashes, there are even hints of a much older lost world, that of Purcell and those other ancient English composers to which Britain was so attached. There's also I'm sure if you know it, you'll recognize this. There's also more than a hint of the famous moonlight sea interlude of Peter Grimes, music's, uh, Britain's music of the future. Perhaps most moving of all for us is the thought, I think, in this slow movement of such music emerging so very far from home. The product of a young man looking eastward anxiously, nostalgically for, from his so temporary Californian residence. In memory for a lost world indeed. And for some reason, I keep thinking when I listen to that movement of that famous passage of Novalis, um, where the question is, Vohin gestu, and the answer is, immer nach Haus. Now, after all this intensity, the last movement of the quartet is like the second, another coda-like inspiration, a mere three minutes when the slow movement lasted more than 10. It begins with a melody that cheekily gestures towards closure and develops by means of a playful fugato, a kind of texture that conventionally appears towards the end of a movement. This is the topsy-turvy world of a piece such as Verdi's Falstaff, or indeed of that composer's string quartet, although it's unlikely, I think, that Britain knew the latter work, <clears throat> one in which academic forms and devices are used in unconventional, destabilizing contexts. Later on in this last movement, there are brief reminiscences of earlier movements, in particular a pause, perhaps a disquieting one, on the tonal and melodic sphere 
of the slow movement. But the quartet ends in a show of fireworks with ferocious technical demands, the viola, Britain's own instrument, particularly exposed, and at the last, an almost desperately emphatic return to, would you believe it, D major. Now, talking to the Badger Quartet as they've developed this piece has been, for me, quite a fascinating experience. And I talk to them quite often, in part because, and a de declaration of interest here, one of them is my daughter. Now, as you'll hear immediately, the piece makes extreme technical demands on the players. Initially conceived for the famous Griller Quartet, an English ensemble of great distinction in the uh, post-war period. It was eventually premiered by the Coolidge Quartet, a renowned US ensemble, although the Grillers then did give the piece its UK premiere in 1943. You can hear recordings of both these groups, alas, in neither case did they record this quartet, at least so far as I can discover, on that precious modern archive that is YouTube. And even a brief exploration will demonstrate how musically sophisticated their yes, these yesteryear ensembles were. And what is more, the discography, discographies testify to a steady commitment to what was then modern music. Even so, this Britain string quartet must have stretched them to the absolute limit. However, the banker have told me that at least as challenging uh, with this quartet is the need to control the total effect of the piece, to find a satisfying way of dealing with the extreme imbalance between the lengths of the movements. How does one project that very brief second and very brief fourth movement, which as I said could almost be thought of as coders to the movements that precede them? As a musicologist, I'm, attem I'm tempted to say that Britain was at this stage still, still self-consciously experimenting at this early, relatively early stage of his career. You should recall that he was still in his 20s in 1941 and that the extreme contrasts of the first movement and the lyrical intensity of the third movement permitted expansion uh, in those movements while the other movements simply couldn't sustain further elaboration. But performers have somehow to project a sense of cohesion to the whole. And in this case, how is that to be done is I think a quite important question uh, for performers. Now I could continue with such questions, but I'm aware, at least I hope I'm aware, that the Badger Quartet are waiting and the music calls. So let me end there and for the first time in three years on the Gresham stage introduce you to the Badger Quartet. So join me in welcoming them, uh, Charlotte Scott, first violin, Emma Parker, second, second violin, John Thorne, viola, and Jonathan Byers, cello.
Thank you. 